the set you guys have, like say you're going to do the dialogue for that day, the actors say that you're holding the boom, right, Vinny, and then you're behind Video Village, and then you guys are all... Not Video Village. Uh, not Video Village. Where are you at? On the set somewhere. On the set. Like hiding okay. in somewhere. Yeah. Hiding somewhere. I hate Video Village. I hate Video Village. But you're screaming things from, like, the background. I remember Dina said, he'll be in a closet. He'll be anywhere. Like, he'll yeah. find a way to get there. But I wonder, those... Like, it, it's writing. You guys are writing as you're doing it. It never is, stops, yeah. Is that something that you work out the morning of? Or is that something that you guys are literally just in the moment as you guys are shooting? It doesn't stop, you know. It's a constant we, we We try, well, I mean, we went through the rainbow twice while we were shooting. So it was like a lot of, there were a lot of <laughs> in production. Some days we would have two scripts per day. Uh, you know, just because we were so nimble. And, and writing and, during lunch, for some and, and, like, Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, we just were, you know, it... Again, it's a fear. We've written a bunch of screenplays, and there's a fear, uh, and I don't mean this in any disrespect to screenwriters, but there's a fear that the movie dies on the page. That there are so many amazing screenplays. I mean, I've read so many great screenplays that just people have this Apple P mentality that they're just going to print the script as it exists. And, you know, we don't, we, it, that's impossible. That's just impossible. And, and the best thing we can do is, is try to, the script. Is, is the best as a motivating device and a, uh, and a very detailed uh, guide for the actors. And that's what we spend so much time working on. And, and in really? particular for us as directors, I can use specific words in the screenplay that I know correlate to certain wardrobe uh, ideas or, or art department ideas or blocking ideas. You know what I mean? It's, e it's easy when you're talking to yourself. Right, and, and in terms of like my role when they're in production, I and mean, we did write all through production. You know, it's funny because um, outside of production, you know, I just feel you know one of you know the part of the job I like the best is trying to push to elevate the script as, as much as possible and bring new ideas to it, and and uh, maybe contradict it and add layers to it. But on when it comes time to production, these guys, their job is to heat up and prod up the material and inflame it and mine for something new, something that's better than what's on the page. So during production, I am at Video Village. I'm sort of sitting there and I'm like a, I'm like chained to the script. I'm like a, I'm like a, I'm like a lawyer for the script in a sense. I'm there representing it and making sure I'm listening so that when things fly off and, you, and they discover something incredible in the moment and everyone's totally on, you know, on cloud nine about it, that they're just making sure that they're not moving away from certain things that must be spoken or for the sake of the narrative progression of the story. Yeah, I always wonder... The script supervisor and the script lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, like I, I always wonder how... The script supervisor, it's a very... It's hard for anyone to be a script supervisor for us. Yeah. It's very hard because every take is a little different. The amount of, like, RAM that you'd have to recall, it's just Benny and I, and that's, I think, part of the reason why he likes to boom and listen is that, you know, we're just listening for edit points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. I mean, micro edit points when you're dealing with shot, you know, it's one thing to, you know, when you think of the inverse relationship between the, um, the freedom that you give a performer versus technical precision, you know, there's a reason why when you mic up everyone and you let actors step on each other's lines, you know, usually you shoot in um, tableau and wide, you know? But we're obsessed with the shot reverse shot. We never want to relinquish rhythm. We want to have total control over rhythm um, at all times. So that means that when you have people talking over each other in a shot reverse shot situation, finding an edit point is like microsurgery. I mean, isn't that we, we have two cameras, but we don't have the AB. You know? Yeah. Yes. That's so incredible because just having that much control over what is chaos. Nobody watching that. They obviously we know their skill and precision to do it, but when you're watching it, you're just feeling this, this this anxiety, and it's not on the page. When you read the screenplay, it moves and it's quick, but you don't feel like mm -hmm. what you guys are able to put well, on that screen. Was, that was interesting in the process again, because you you know this this the the production was 32 days uh, and and a day in Africa, but but the the lifespan of the movie is, you know, mostly in pre-production. And this movie in particular is because of the nine years of prep. And most of our, most of the, most of people who experienced the film experienced it by reading. And, but there was that reaction on the page, which was, I couldn't put it down. Yeah. I wanted to know what was gonna happen. Uh, I, and I, 
and I could, and I, I remember Scott Rudin a asking me early on, and he got involved three years ago. Uh, this is a hundred and sixty plus page script. How long do you imagine this movie being? Because I'll tell you, but the butt gets tired after two hours. Like yep. the body actually doesn't like sitting for two hours. And I said, no, this is a ninety minute movie. And he said, how is that possible? I said, it's a ninety minute movie conceptually, and and and, and we really believed that. You know what I mean? We really. We really we believed that you could have all this dialogue on a page, and and it would function in the way that a ninety minute movie functions. And, and there's something about having more than you're going to use because when you shrink it down, you know, like shrink wrap it, it, it gets that much more focus. I mean, they say a minute a page, so you guys did a lot of shrinking. Let's do it that way. I want to make sure we get a little bit of time for. There was um, there was, there was a, a part where it says yes that Arma. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> try and build the suspense. It, it is Ronnie's favorite. Um, obviously, WGA's guys, you'll have access to it, but I really highly advise you to read it. It was highly entertaining to see what they took from the page to what you get to see on screen. I'm going to toss it out to the audience real quick. If anyone has any questions, I see um, yes, ma'am. Four in the back. No. Yeah, right four here. Four people who are leaving. Oh no, no, no! Right here, yes, ma'am. Huh. You're one of probably yes. you're the only person. Are you like a gemstone that expert? That that you know that. Geologist you educated us. Right. Basically, she okay. told us that um, when the rock gets wet, it's not going to be cool anymore, and that she thought that was a plot point. But these well, guys, actually, the you know uh, a lot of Ethiopian opals are actually preserved in water. Uh, yes. The reverse side of it, but you have to seal it. Jeez, but, very, very, uh, you should do a gem class after this. I think we need to get your your expertise. No, on the, there's gems. no geological importance of it having been in the water and then in in his hand. Uh, um, but there is there there is uh, that is a mo that is a sobering moment of Howard with the opal, where the opal actually has no power whatsoever. It doesn't you know. It, it's just a piece of matter in his hand that he's caressing. Well, yeah, and if he if he is the gem, like it's hard for him to have a self-reflexive moment, you know, looking at himself and all of it. Yeah. Um, do we have and also, questions? if you knew that in 2012, that was when they discovered a bunch of black opals in Ethiopia, and then since then they've all started to craze and crack and now lost value. And the Australian people who lent us a lot of the opals that come are the, are inside our hero opal. They were actually a little bit. They were adverse to, to lending them to us because they didn't like the idea of giving any positive VR to the Ethiopian yes. Yes, to the competition. Oh, so. um, gotcha. Okay, yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm gonna go right over here if you don't mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, talk about the score. Uh, yeah, Daniel O'Patton's score is. Um, was another form of writing. Uh, probably twelve week, twelve weeks we spent um, working on the score, and, and it started with um, just cycling through all of Daniel's synthesizers. In particular, Moog. The we are, this is the first score to use the Moog One, and they made Moog made a lot of uh, patches specifically for us sounds that we were after, and we would just go through like all of them, the thousands and thousands of library sounds, and I would just say that one this one and we would take notes okay and then we'd collect them all and then we'd listen to them and have them in the back of the head and know which ones evoke which, which weird uh, 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 feelings and emotions but it's a cosmic uh, score that you know it's like a new age score that's trying to do so much that it ends up not being new age at all incredible um, I'm going to do yes sir uh, how did the John Amos come to <laughs> it actually started with Felicia Rashad yeah, I, I uh, I don't know, we were, we were in the booth, Josh was coming, so I was laying down the sort of tracks for that scene, and, <laughs> you know, that I, he's trying to, right, I mean, what's the, the, he's trying to find some place to let his son use the bathroom, and then I was just thinking, wow, you know, if you live in New York City and you're in a nice apartment, you know, it's strange, people like this live on your floor, I don't live in a nice apartment. But, but people live on your on your floor, you know, and you don't get to know them and they're there. And it was like, well, who's who's on that level of success that would be in a nice 
apartment on the Upper East Side, but not no, too Midtown. nice. It's Midtown. Uh, Midtown. It's yeah. Because yeah. Then one of the apartments we were looking at, yeah. Rosie, Rosie O'Donnell, O'Donnell actually oh, happened yeah. to have been one of the. But she's too successful. But she's it made sense. But it was a yes. strange building. I went, when I was a kid, you know, uh, whatever, you know. So, um, so first it was Felicia Rashad, and then it was John Ames. So Felicia true. Rashad said no because there was a Cosby reference in the script, and but we wrote this what, before. What, you know, before what happened was, was there was he true. said he said to his son, "You've seen the Cosby Show," and the kid has no he's beyond it. And he goes with the guy, he says it like that, yeah. you know, and it was a great line because that's how it would filter down to someone who's not part of the news cycle, just kind of a creepy guy, and. Uh, and, and and then you know she, obviously she said no. Um, she didn't want to be part of that, which I don't blame her. Uh, and then and then and then we landed on. Well, we got John instead, which yeah. is really good. Yeah. Um, again, I want to mention the fact that the film um, has already been nominated for five Independent Spirit Awards, if I'm correct. And then you guys just won for Best Director at New York Film Critics Circle. We got, we got the NBR, NBR, and the screenplay award for the NBR. And the and NBR. So. And she, Tell them, Go ahead. Critics' Choice. And the Critics' Choice. <laughs> I'm not going to go down all the really cool things you did, but I definitely I want to shout out that. Oklahoma. Uh, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I, yes, Oklahoma City Critics. Oh my God, when I go down to the subway, I show all these things yeah. to the person I start. I have, a, I get I have the a picture on my, on my jacket. Yeah. Well, it's something I've actually gotten really... a tattoo on my back. <laughs> well, it's something to be proud of. It is very exciting. It's very something to be proud of, but I want to ask you guys from the screenplay really quickly if you guys can just tell me what line or stage direction you're most proud of or something that you're like, you know, you know when you're writing and you're like, oh, I'm not juices on this one. <laughs> oh, oh so, I'll just go first. Uh, it was, again, Josh, you know, Josh made a point. It was horrible in the projection booth. I just want to correct that a little bit. It's not like we needed to photosynthesize. You know, we had like this room, whatever, you know. Movies turned from 35 millimeter to DCP. And at first that was, uh, that was horrible for me, you know, qualitatively. What's the line? Well, in the script. Sorry, I'm moving it off. But, but uh, I was in the booth and, and, and just describing that track into the wound at the end and, and looping that back to the beginning was like, wow. You know. That's brilliant. All right, Benny. I'm trying to think. I'm trying you can, to... I can skip you. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's All right. Back. Um, my favorite line or description from or something, my yeah. Favorite, like, my favorite line the Jews favorite. and Colin, the Jews and Colin Cancer. When I read that, it was, that was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's uh, a good one. That's I'd really say... Good. Um, Yes, that Arno. Yes, it's that Arno. It's an inside joke amongst us in the script when it, when you, when we get to the Seder scene, we introduce everyone at the Seder scene and then we say and Arno, and then you know we have to let the people know in the script that it's the same Arno that was just in the SUV with him during those so, so, and we all hated that, so that's why it's very memorable for me like, because it said in parentheses in bold, yes, that Arno. <laughs> and it, made, it made the reading experience kind of uh, Disney Disneyfied a little bit, so it was fun. And the other, the other one was one that was cut out for by Keith, you know, the, with the dog. It's too long to get into. It's too long to get into. Read the script, find, maybe hit them up after. I got one more, and I'll go right to the back. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you for the film. Um, if you were to distill it down to a sentence or a handful of words, this is not the group for that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> I go back about the projection booth. Keep going, I'm sorry, I was just leaving. Um, he's asking these very long winded, very verbose directors to break down that entire movie into one line, so go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, I mean, it's called Uncut Gems, and uh, we spent 10 years mining flawed characters and loving them in spite of their flaws, and an uncut gem is is something that people deem without value because they're like, that's worthless. And most people don't take the time to get underneath uh, the flaws and get past things to get at some deeper value. And, and uh, Howard and all the characters in this movie are uncut gems. So. You find beauty in the flaws. Mm-hmm. I agree with both those things, but I'll contradict it just for the sake of doing so. Um, uh, there are winners and there are losers and uh, Sometimes uh, they are both. And there are there is an old testament God that wants you to stay in your lane or he will smite you. <laughs> I don't love that. More people need to stay in your lane. I want to thank you all for yeah. listening. I want to thank the writers, editors, directors, and cut down. Please tell everyone to check it out because it's a theater scene.